It's really difficult to get your first feature as a director off the ground, but it could be just as hard to get the second one off the ground too, even if your first one uh, got a whole lot of Academy Award love. So what would you say is one big misconception about what it means to make your second feature? But then on the other hand, what is something about Promising Young Woman that really did help you get salt, salt burn off the ground and made the way you wanted? God, that's an incredibly difficult question to answer, but I love it. But I love it. Um, so I think the thing, the the thing that is, what promising a woman did, and what the incredible success that truly like none of us could have ever expected did, was it enabled me to do the thing, to have the process which I can only really do, which is to go away, not tell anyone what I'm working on not show anyone anything at all, not talk about it. I write it and then I give it to, you know, my managers and agents and say, this is the thing that I want to make. If anyone else wants to make it, incredible, you know, and if not, that's fine. We can find something else. And so I think what it does is it means that you don't end up in that very sticky place, which lots of filmmakers, I think, can get caught up in, which is that thing of development. Everyone loves an idea. They think it's really sexy. Then you deliver the script and they're like, oh, I thought it was going to be something different because when you pitched in in the room and like, oh, I always imagined this actor in it, not this actor. You know, the thing is, is that what happens then is you are kind of making something by committee. And obviously, the moment you start casting, the moment you start being in prep and all of that kind of stuff, you become, it becomes completely egalitarian. It, 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 you have every, you desire, you need everyone's input. That's what's so wonderful. It is a group effort making a movie. But I think the writing of it and the kind of, you know, the the sort of, the conceiving of the thing that you want to make in all of the different ways has to be completely solitary for me. And so that process meant it was, that process enabled me to make the thing I wanted to make next. I think if I'd pitched this movie in all of its kind of gory detail, people would have said, yes, but maybe we could change this. You know, it minimizes the, the in interference. I, think. I am so glad you made this movie the exact way you wanted, because I can't imagine it any other way. Thank you. Thank you so much. So bringing up the uh, the collaborative nature, once you do wind up hitting the set, it does make me wonder, what would you say is the biggest difference between draft one of this screenplay and what we will now see in the finished film? Oh, that's so interesting. Hmm. You know, I try to be pretty close try to be pretty close to the draft. I'm quite a stickler. Um, but I think that, I think that once the actors come in, the connection and the love becomes more apparent. You know, they add, they, they add a huge amount of, I think what we worked on a lot in the, you know, once they all came on board was why they love each other. Even if we're talking about people who are not capable of, or good at showing love. I mean, there's no one in this film who actually knows how to communicate love effectively or in a healthy way. So, so much of our work then was, was in the kind of, in the deep parts of why they love each other and what it feels like to love people and, and how that is complicated. And I think that really, you really feel that, that in the movie. Oh, I can't wait to jump to your ensemble. But first, I do have a question that I wanted to ask based on another interview I heard you had done where you mentioned that along the way, there were some other characters that fell by the wayside. Oh, yeah. Can you share anything about one of those characters? It's so funny, isn't it? Because you sort of like all of those people got slaughtered for a reason. <laughs> they all got booted off a cliff for a reason. I think that there was more stuff at Oxford initially. So there was more Michael Gavey, who was Oliver's f sort of friend who gets immediately like culled once he gets better offer. Um, there were also some more of the, what I would call the like, the collateral damage of the Catton family. So we had a few more we we there was there was a there was a moment with one of the boys from the past, one of the former favorites. Uh, but you know, it's difficult with this film because there are so many characters. It's actually really it really is a kind of ensemble, and 
the, the problem is, is the more people you have, the less time you then spend on the people that you really love and need to know. So, so there, you know, I mean, there were so many, there, there's a world where this film could have been like 20 hours long and, and had been, you know, I mean, poor dear Pamela and Elspeth alone could be their own film. <laughs> I would watch that really long version of this film, but also it's nice to know that that world and that experience exists or be convinced that it exists based on this shorter, more contained version of the story that we do get. Yes. All right. Jumping back to your ensemble. Actually, first, a directing actor's question for you. Yet again, another big old compound question. What is something that another director did for you in the past that you appreciated and always strive to do for your actors when you're directing? But then on the other hand, what is something that you wished more actors, directors had done for you that now you always make sure your cast has? Oh, that's a really good question. I think so. I think Chanya Button, who is an incredible director who directed a film called Visa in Virginia that I was in, is an, is an absolute expert at running a trust-based, warm set. You know, she makes sure she has time for everyone. She's incredibly inspiring. She's resolute, but kind. I think that she is so inspiring when it comes to just, yeah, kind of creating the kind of atmosphere that means people can play. And that's something that's so important to me to, to have, you know, to, to make a space sound so kind of twee and cheesy, but to make a space where people feel that they can like make mistakes, where they feel that they can come to you with an idea that is outlandish and that you're, they're not going to be like crucified for it. She was so inspiring in that regard. Also, Joe Wright, I have to say, you know, he is so specific about what he wants in a way that I find really gratifying, that, that I really responded to as an act. And as an actor, what I liked was the detail. What I liked was the precision. What I liked was almost you are kind of a, he tells you exactly, he has an exact thing in his mind. And it's, and it's, there's something so like wonderful about being, giving yourself over to that kind of process, giving yourself over to someone for them to tell you exactly what they want. That's, that I found very like, um, interesting and kind of inspiring. And then, you know, I think truly, the thing that I hated most as an actress was the sense that there was a conversation going on by the monitor that wasn't coming to me. That the, 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 in the walk between Video Village, to me, something was being sugarcoated. And I just hate it. Hate it. Hate it. It made me feel gross and insecure and freaked out like a baby. And so the thing that I always do and I kind of like talk to actors even before we're like getting into it is say like is establish how like honest we can be with each other. It's not to say that I'll ever be cruel, but, uh, and, and that runs both ways. It's that it's actually, it's the opposite. It's like, we're all in this together. From the beginning, there are no nice trailers. Everyone has the same shitty two way. Nobody goes back to base for changes. There's a makeup station on set. There's a green room on set. Whether you've got one line or you're the star, that's where you hang out. We all eat together, cast and crew. There are, you know, I, it is very, very important to me that everyone understands that we are in this together and we are all able to be as honest with each other. We're not going to pussyfoot around each other. And when you're making a film that is, you know, as complicated and sticky and exposing as this film is for all of us, you know, not least the actors, you have got to trust each other. And you've also got to trust that your boundaries will be respected too. That's a big, big thing for me. Like we had an amazing intimacy coordinator and... It meant that all of us felt so much more comfortable just talking about stuff. And, you know, it's just it's just treating everyone like grown-ups and expecting that, that you yourself will be treated like a grown-up too. Like there is nothing in the world that makes me more impatient than the sense I'm being managed. It, it makes me insane. And it's designed to make you insane. It's that simple. I don't understand why every single person at the uh, at the helm of a film does not lead their company that way. Because a lot of them are not concerned with with that. It doesn't concern them. If you're them. not concerned with that, you're not you're not concerned about the quality of your film overall because ultimately that trickles down and it breaks my heart to think about a film being ruined that way. Well, and but also I think the thing that's really important is it's not just a kind of basic level of human decency and care. It's not to say I'm perfect, by the way. Like, you know, we all have our moments. But it's actually just a bad business because the truth of it is, is if you're all happy and you all love each other and you'll respect each other, you do work that is better. 
and more interesting and more difficult. You know, I've no interest in making something. I want to make something complicated. I want to make something messy and difficult that people argue about and that, you know, that isn't going to necessarily be like the most easy to sort of pin down thing. And in order to make something like that, you've got to yeah, you you have to create a very specific kind of environment. So beautiful answer and beautiful approach. I want to squeeze in one or two spoiler questions. Sure. But before I do that, just to briefly touch on what could come next from you, because I love horror movies and I see a very like intoxicating darkness now in both of the films that you've made. So it is leaving me wondering, is a full-fledged horror movie in your future? Definitely. I mean, I don't know that it will necessarily be the next thing, but I am a horror fiend. I think horror is the greatest. It's the greatest. And and so and it's so exciting now that horror movies seem to be getting their kind of just, you know, they seem to be getting their just desserts, right? They're getting their due. Horror is, yeah, it's one of the first, it was one of the first movie mediums, right? Horror and romance, the gothic, that's what movies were made to do. So yeah, absolutely. I hope so one day. I also heard you're a big fan of Are You Afraid of the Dark? And so that left me wondering, what is your favorite Are You Afraid of the Dark okay. episode? I think second? it's everyone's favorite. It's Melissa Joan Hart, I'm Cold. It's the boy standing outside her window saying, I'm cold. And the yes. twist is that it's a boy who died because he didn't have his sweater and it was in a log. And I was like, oh, how can I be both so terrified of this, but also so moved by Sabrina the Teenage Witch? I hear that one a lot. I love Tale of uh, the Midnight Madness, the Nosferatu inspired one. Oh that my God, one. I don't remember Earth that one. Brain. It's so good. It's, it was a gateway horror experience where right. I had to know what inspired it after. Did you have the game? Did you have the PC game? I, I want, <laughs> I need that game. I need to play that game again because the music still gives me chills. Like I still think about that game all the time. The eyeballs having to do, I mean, that game was insanely frightening for a tiny child. That was my world for a really, really oh, long time. Oh, me too. Time. I could talk about, are you afraid of the dark all day long? They're going to kick me out in a okay. minute. So I'm going to try to squeeze in one or two spoiler questions. First, this is more of a theory question. Have you ever wondered how things might have progressed if Felix never took Oliver back home and learned the truth about his family? Yes, all the time. So because what would have happened next? Was it inevitable that eventually I they think, would wind up? I think yeah. you, I think, I mean, certainly the thing is, is I can't answer those questions because so necessarily the film leaves those things unresolved. But I think you probably know, you know, that's the thing. We, we're only, we're all just reacting in the moment. No matter how, like, you know, no matter how meticulously we plan things, it was the same with Promising Young Woman. We are not in control of the way that other people behave. We can't be. And so we have to react to that. But, you know, it is a love story. It should have been a love story. Oh, that breaks my heart when you put it that way. I'll ask one question about working with Barry now. Which scene of the bunch was most challenging to calibrate in terms of making sure his performance had the right balance of, you know, being truly who that character is, but also who he's presenting himself to be in the moment? I think it's all the early stuff at Oxford, you know? The sort of it, it's uh, um, particularly the kind of like you know the the scent when the moment that Felix feels that he's pulling away and Oliver intensifies his kind of made up story. It, I think the thing for me is that we know from the very beginning of this movie, from the framing narrative, what's going to happen. We know who he is already. You know, there's no surprises there. The one surprise I was really the only surprise I was really hoping to kind of keep was was who Oliver's family are. The rest of it, we know. we know. We just don't know exactly how. We get a scent. We just don't know exactly how or what necessarily. But that that was important to me because that should feel as devastating for us as it feels for him. The moment that we know what's happening and Felix hasn't clocked it yet. <laughs> and he's like, this is nice, mate. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> he's perfect in that your whole ensemble here is perfect I can't I've only seen it once at this point I can't wait to go back and oh. watch it again knowing every single thing that Thank happened you. so that I could track all these little things that I probably missed the first time around also because I saw it at Fantastic Fest and the audience there was eating it up oh yay well it's made for an audience 
So I, you know, people squirming. It's the best. Great success based on the one viewing I've had thus far. And I have a feeling everyone's doing that. Thank you for your time today. Congratulations. Thanks, Perry. Thank you.